Have you been thinking about diversifying your property portfolio, but ensure how or where to invest next? SJR Property Group is a buyer's agency based in Perth, specialising in helping East Coast investors diversify their portfolios. We focus on helping our clients achieve their financial goals by investing in high quality, high cash flow investment properties that are poised for long-term capital growth. If you've been thinking of investing in the WA market, the team at SJR have feet on the ground and are here to help. Visit sjrpropertygroup.com.au or call us today on 1300 757 774 to chat with an expert. This is a Momentum Media production. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. Hello, everyone. Grace Ormsby here. Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Smart Property Investment Show. This is a very interesting episode. I recently sat down with the president of the Real Estate Institute of Australia, Hayden Groves, to get the lowdown on what the last rate rise means and also what's just going on in the wider market. How bad is housing affordability actually at the moment? So take a listen. It's well worth it. You will leave that episode feeling very much more informed and educated than you were before. Hayden, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for taking the time again. Well, Grace, I could say the same. It is always a great privilege to talk to you and your listeners. So thank you most sincerely for inviting me along. Of course. You do have a very cool helicopter view, which I think I say every time you do come on the show, it's important to remind everyone that, you know, you are looking across the broad spectrum of Australian property markets. So your perspective is very, very valuable, especially the week of a rate decision. So Reserve Bank of Australia again came out on Tuesday, lifted the rates above 4%. Were you expecting it? Oh, look, we we probably did sort of when, when the latest inflation, the monthly inflation figures first hit the media released and there was an uptick from the previous month, that really did flag with us an expectation that the reserve would move again. And I think if we saw what happened when in March they decided to hold rates, I think a lot of the consumer market thought, oh, that's it, you know, rates have stopped rising and we're okay now and this is about as it's going to get and let's get on. And so we saw a bit of confidence come back into property markets almost instantaneously. It didn't last long, of course, because the following month the reserve <laughs> acted again and put the rates up again. And of course, having done it again for June really has, I think, taken the wind out of uh, the sales to a certain extent. It's interesting though, isn't it, Grace, that we really haven't seen a significant impact on property markets across Australia other than perhaps in Tasmania. No, you're right. We're seeing property values rise yet again in markets like Sydney, which are are coming off really high base. And in fact, year-to-date figures coming out of Sydney, according to CoreLogic numbers, is seeing you know 4% growth year-to-date in Sydney, uh, which is just extraordinary. So you can do, it just goes to show, doesn't it, that when you have a market of constrained supply, which we continue to, to face that challenge across Australia, whenever you've got a market like that, you can do what the reserve can do what it likes with interest rates. It, it doesn't seem to impact too significantly on people's desire to have Um, and need to have a roof over their head. For sure. And Hayden, I think it's also interesting to note too that we're entering, well, we are in winter now, which means that this time of year is particularly slow anyway. So it is an interesting, I guess, contrast with what we're seeing going on with the rate environment. We're seeing inflation continue to go up. We're still seeing house prices lift, see some kind of stability and lift. And then you've got all that against the backdrop of what should be a really quiet period for real estate. Absolutely. And that's, you know, we're seeing clearance, auction clearance rates in the big capitals on the East Coast, you know, nudging 80% clearance rates compared to this time last year where clearance rates were in the low 50 percentile region. And so there is definitely an appetite from buyers at the moment to secure Mm. their homes. And also the investor market is actually still relatively strong. So we are still seeing in terms of percentage of overall mortgage commitments, you know, sort of around that, hovering around that 30%, which is, you know, the long-term averages 
for mortgage commitments, still they're going to the investor market. So investors are still active in the market. Now, investors, of course, Grace, as we know, will, will generally only ever buy in a rising market or where they feel as if there's some upside. Obviously, yields are getting much better from residential rental stock perspective because rents are on the increase and on the move and, and really going up at a pretty steep trajectory simply because, again, it goes back to this supply problem. You know, when you can look at, look at listing stock right now, you know, apart from, from Hobart, you know, new listing stock coming into the market, looking at the numbers, uh, they're all below, they're all falling still now. And so uh, compared to 12 months ago, the listing stock in Melbourne, for example, is 28% less than it was 12 months ago. Uh, mm. And new listings coming into the market are coming in at a far slower rate than they were this time last year, apart from that that outlier of, uh, of Hobart and Canberra now starting to get a bit more stock coming into that market, into its market. So until that really starts to change and we start to see a bit more stock come on, this low supply environment that we're in will probably continue to put upward pressure on prices despite the Reserve Bank doing its best to curb our enthusiasm for spending money at the moment. Normally, Hayden, I don't ask the question of where do you see the market does go from here until right at the end of the episode, because I know there's still plenty of stuff for us to be unpacking, but I do feel like this is probably the perfect segue to bring up. Where do you think it does go from here? I think we'll see a bit more of an evening out of Australian property markets across the major centres and the major capitals. If you look at the relative affordability of cities like Perth, in Darwin, for example, relative to East Coast cities. Adelaide is already on its way. You know, it's still continuing to perform very well in terms of house price growth there. Hobart is adjusting the other way and it probably needed to. It was a little bit too hot there in recent times. You know, the the growth rates, I think, will start to even out. So even though Sydney is showing a, a bit of a clean pair of heels still, as it always does, you know, at 4% year-to-date growth, you know, that that I don't think will grow. Sydney won't grow as quickly as, say, I think Perth will, particularly off the back of this increased migration intake. You know, we're we're expecting because we need the labour, we need the people here. I mean, where we're going to put them to live remains Mm. to be seen, of course. But, you know, between now and the end of 2024, we're expecting to have, you know, another 600,000 people come into the, the country and that inevitably will just keep that pressure, that downward pressure on, on supply as they all need somewhere to live. And so I think when they're making these decisions, particularly overseas migrants making their decisions as to which cities to live in, they will look to the more affordable capitals. And that's why I think there will be upward pressure in cities like Perth for some time. So we should see prices go there. And Brisbane, you know, hosting the Olympic Games not too far away about a decade away and 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 they you know big infrastructure spend there just got back from Arak and the gold coast and you know the the median prices there are, are extraordinary and and there's a lot of the atmosphere in the city like the gold coast is is terrific and so there's i think there's a lot of upside on australian property markets mm. not just from a fundamental economics macroeconomics side of things but i think just that this um inability to get more supply into the market quickly is inevitably going to continue to have upward pressure on price for the foreseeable future. I can't see it going any other way. On that topic of supply, and it has been a bit of a, it's becoming a more hotly contested argument around the immigration figures that we're now expecting over the next 18 months or so. Where do you stand for that, you know, that on the balance of that needing to bring people in for basically to keep us out of economic dire straits, but also the issue of supply, which has really come to a head over the last 12 months as it is. Well, supply is really the number one factor in the the residential property market right now. It's the the number one challenge that, that everybody is facing and everybody is impacted by, and that's from tenants and home owners, of course, perspective. But, you know, government is lagging behind a bit on this matter, and I think it's probably been neglected for some time. If you think about the way housing policy settings have been in this country, you've got three tiers of government all trying to deal with it. You've got the federal government that can pull limited levers, more of a funding sort of angle that they have, or they have taxation settings, things like negative gearing and and capital gains tax discounts. You know, those are fundamental 
underpinnings for getting more rental supply, particularly into the market. And that's why we're really grateful at the RAIA to the Albanese government's commitment, ongoing commitment to maintaining the current negative gearing and capital gains tax settings for Australia. Because, you know, for generations, we've relied on mum and dad, unsophisticated investors buying residential property to house Australians. That's the overwhelming majority of all housing stock is from that particular cohort. And if you mess with that or if you disincentivize that cohort, well, the government has to fill the holes and they haven't been able to do that for, for generations and nor have they expressed an interest to do that. And then, of course, you've got state governments, which, of course, are responsible for planning laws and they often have a, a significant tussle with local governments who struggle with a fair degree of NIMBY activity in local communities that don't want to see more density, for example. Or, mm. And so I think there has been a, a systemic tussle between the different layers of government to deliver more affordable housing. And then that's just really been a, a real spotlight's been shone on it and it's been exacerbated in recent times because of the fierce increase in the cost of delivering housing in recent times. Cost of materials, cost of labour has poured fuel on this low supply trajectory that we were already on. And so that that's why I think it's become such a political hot potato right now. And it's a real shame, isn't it, to see that certain political parties have decided to hold up passage of legisl- really important legislation that housing Australian future funds in the upper house of our federal parliament right now uh, really does need to get passed. I mean, it's Perhaps it's imperfect legislation, and that's the reason why the Greens and the Liberal Party at the moment are opposing it. But we've got to do something. We've got to get on with it. Mm. Let's not make the pursuit of the ideological perfect be the enemy of the good. And so we are encouraging as best we can the RAIA for the opposition and the Greens to pass that legislation. Get on with it. Let's get some money into the economy to get more housing on the ground right now for those that need it most. Yeah, I mean, it's been a conversation for a long time. Supply issues are not going away overnight. So it is one of those things that the sooner you start, really, the better off everyone will be as a result down the track. So don't go away. We've got more from Hayden Groves just after the break. Are you feeling the strain of high mortgage repayments? Refinancing with Finney Mortgages can help you save big on your home loan and ease the burden on your finances. Our team of expert brokers specialises in helping Australian investors find the best possible rates. Refinance with Finney Mortgages today and start saving. Visit finney.com.au or call us now at 028 866 2444 to chat with an expert. Welcome back to this very special conversation with President of the Real Estate Institute of Australia, Hayden Groves. Hayden, just before the break, we were talking about supply and how that in turn is causing issues with affordability across the country, dovetailing that in with the Reserve Bank of Australia's decision to lift rates. And a lot of people are now starting to find themselves struggling, but I think it is nascent of a very much longer term trend. And This is something that you've actually looked at recently. You've got a bit of a report there. Yes, we, we, um, Grace, we, uh, the Real Estate Institute of Australia produces the housing affordability report every quarter. And in more recent times, we started to look a little bit further afield. We started to look at, well, what's the trend in affordability since we started doing the report? And we've been doing the report for about 20 odd years. So we thought, well, let's have a look back and we'll split it up into, you know, how it was, what was rental affordability like? five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago across Australia, and then looked at it and we broke it down by state as well. And we looked at, so general affordability for home ownership. So when we talk about affordability in the context of our housing affordability report, which is relied upon by government in setting their housing policies, we look at it in the context of, well, what's the average income for a a family income in a particular jurisdiction, according to census data? And then we look at also what is the average mortgage in that particular jurisdiction. Now, it's no no surprise, of course, to anybody that housing affordability has deteriorated significantly in the light of the fact that, as we've just been talking about before the break, that we've seen interest rates go up pretty significantly. So the cost of a mortgage in 12 months has increased by about 35% on average across Australia. That's a pretty significant margin. 
Yeah, especially over just such a short period, really, isn't it? Like such a short ex- period. You expect things to get more expensive as time goes on. That's the whole idea of um, you know, the cost of things to to go up, but everything else to go along with it. That's why inflation usually stays within that two to three percent indicator. But as we've seen recently, it's not always the case. It is a very when you look at it graphically, Grace, it's pretty frightening. You see, you see it rising pretty rapidly. And so the income required to meet loan repayments now on average across Australia, according to the end of, at the end of March 2023, is now nearly 45%. So that's the relationship between average incomes and average mortgages. And so now anything over 30%, you're starting to get into mortgage stress territory. So 45% is a startling number. And of course, it's worse in New South Wales than anywhere else because of the high cost of housing uh, to ownership, for home ownership in New South Wales. And so uh, the Sydney market obviously very strong, and so we've uh, with high prices, and so we've we've got there. It's fifty five percent or thereabouts. Wow! On average, so the relationship between the average size of a mortgage in New South Wales versus the average income, and so not many people would, of course, on average wages be able to afford an average mortgage, of course, because you couldn't give away fifty five percent of your income uh, on a huge. monthly basis and live the rest of your life comfortably. And so, but put that into context compared to this time last year. 35% of average incomes went to the average mortgage. So that's a deterioration of 10% in 12 months, which is really significant. And we've never seen that happen before. And putting it into context of median rents. So if we compare it to, there's a lot of discussion in the media at the moment about the rental crisis. And we know that it's very tough for tenants right now. We are seeing through short supply, rents increase rapidly across the nation. Vacancy rates at around, hovering around nationally at around 1%. And in some jurisdictions, you know, half of that in Perth, for example, it's about 0.6 of 1%. And so very low vacancy rates and, and therefore upward pressure on rents. But to put it into context, rental affordability at the moment, so the proportion of rent payable relative to the proportion of income, average incomes is running at 23%. So that is about half of, mm. or roughly, roughly half, a bit over half of what it is to affordable to buy a home. So yeah, the very, wow. Very significant difference. And rental affordability, in fact, has been very stable. If we look, go, we, we went back, as I said earlier, we went back five years, 10 years, 20 years, and rental affordability across Australia, so this is across all jurisdictions in Australia, has actually only, is actually improved compared to five years ago. <laughs> Not by yes. much, only by 0.7 of 1%. And it's really in 20 years, rental affordability has only deteriorated by 0.8 of 1% compared to home ownership affordability, which has deteriorated by 14%. And so it is still significantly cheaper to rent than buy across Australia, despite the fact that we are seeing significant increases in rent in recent times. And you know, I don't want to take away from the plight of, of tenants at the moment. It is very tough for tenants. We know that. We're just putting that into context because the numbers don't lie. And so mm. when you've got politicians and certain persuasions calling for a rent cap and a rent freeze, well-intentioned, but the reality is is the rental market tends to even itself out across a long period of time uh, far better than um, housing affordability for people that can afford to buy. And so mm. really some really interesting stats. And if you break it down state by state, it gets even more interesting. You know, if you compare, say, I was talking about the afford- relative affordability of the Western Australian market, for example. It is enviably more affordable here than anywhere else across the nation. And home loan affordability in the last five years has only really deteriorated by about 6%. Rental affordability, a really hot rental market in WA right now, it's deteriorated by about 4%. In contrast, New South Wales, home loan affordability has fallen, has got worse by about 17% over the last five years, nearly 20%. In 20 years. But in fact, making rent repayments, affordability for rent repayments compared to five years ago has actually improved. It's better now than it was five years ago. So it's really interesting when you look at the numbers a bit more closely and you really start to see what's going on across Australian property markets, thanks to the work of the REIA and my terrific team there and the housing affordability report. Yeah, a lot of work would have gone into this, Hayden. I, I'm sure. I'd love to know then, since you mentioned before the break about people heading migrants moving towards Perth, obviously for the cheaper rental situation over there. Brisbane, you also mentioned as being a bit of a hotspot for further migration. And and is that going to play out or is it already playing out in based on housing affordability up there too? 
Well, it's it's a very similar look to the rest of the East Coast at the moment in Brisbane. When you look at the sort of like compared to the, the housing affordability and the rental affordability relative to say five, 10 and, and 20 years ago, rental affordability now in, in Queensland is actually better now than it was five years ago. Home loan affordability is, is significantly worse by about 11%. But we also did another piece of work recently, and we focused on the Gold Coast because, of course, it's a high volume. It's at that southeast queen, corner of Queensland. It's pretty um, popular. It's, it's very popular. And having coming back there from last week, I mean, you can see why. I mean, it's such a magnificent place to be. Uh, the Gold Coast uh, really turned it on. The weather was perfect. The restaurants were buzzing, and everybody was in a good mood. It was it's a terrific place. And so overseas and interstate migration into southeast Queensland has been enormous in the last 12 months, and it's slowing down. I mean, prior to that, during the pandemic, when there was a rush out of the cities, people from Melbourne and Sydney were, were flooding to places like in regional Queensland, particularly in the southeastern corner there. And so the Gold Coast has had a, a real resurgence. And so we looked at rental affordability in the context of short-stay holiday accommodation. And we did a piece of research that revealed that in the Gold Coast region in its entirety, right now there's about 5,400 Short stay accommodation properties available to short stay rent uh, for holiday makers, uh, predominantly, of course, but also homeowners that have bought these investment properties and choose to use it themselves from time to time. And when they're not using it, they rent it out for the short stay holiday market. And the research that we determined demonstrated that we have about, in contrast, 1700 long term rental market properties on the market that are available for lease. So and the reason why, on a typical two-bedroom apartment that you might own on the Gold Coast, you can earn the same level of income from that particular asset based on average rents that you would get in the long-term market. You can earn the same money in 131 days each year based on mm-hmm. occupancy. And so that's another that poses another policy conundrum for local, state, and federal governments about short the short-stay holiday market. When you've got 180,000 of them in Australia – in the short stay holiday market, that's an awful lot of property that would otherwise, you know, a decade ago or thereabouts, have not been in the short stay market. It would have been in the long term rental market, and so that would have, you know, again. So there's lots of different elements to our property market and the supply chain that's impacting on rental supply, and short stay holiday is one of them. Now, mm-hmm. what the government proposed to do about it, it, it will be really interesting to see what sort of settings they uh, they take from this information in which direction they take their policies. But it was interesting to talk to the Gold Coast mayor up there about that, about this, and he was very interested to find out other ways to try to release some of that stock into the long-term market rather than sitting there in short stay and for long, large parts of the year sitting there empty uh, mm. and being underutilised because that's that's another uh, another challenge that we have. Yeah, I guess it's something that we're going to have to watch this space on. But are there any incentives or, or things that you see as worthwhile to, like, is it that we do need the Band-Aid solutions at the moment just to to get things back to some semblance of normality? Look, I think we do. I think we do need to get some short-term wins because the particularly in the rental market, you know, if you can't find a rental property and you can't, you know, share a house or find a room in a house, then, and you can't move back in with your parents if you're a young person, um, you know, those options aren't available to you. you. It's starting to get pretty dire. You know, the next stages are, are pretty awful. It, it, they include things like couch surfing and living in cars, which is not a good thing for a nation as as wealthy and affluent as, as Australia. And so they, we need to do some more things. Things like that are punitive and, and disincentivize private investment in property is a really bad idea. I mean, all that stuff, none of that stuff works. That's why we ridicule things like rent freezes and rent caps and changes to residential tenancy laws that swing the pendulum too far in favour of, of tenants because investors just put away their checkbooks. They just stop buying residential property and you end up with even more, you know, savage shortage of supply and rents just get even higher and it just makes the problem worse. And so I think, you know, the I've had a little private joke, which I don't mind sharing with you, that I, I think that the, the inner city seat of Melbourne, uh, which is the Greens, leader of the Greens, has been calling for a rent freeze, for an instant rent freeze for two years. Adam Bant's seat, we've, I've suggested that perhaps all of the Greens housing policy should just be implemented as a, as a pilot program in the inner city seat of Melbourne for three years and then come back and see what the market looks like in three years' time. And I can tell you now, 
rental affordability would be much worse. Investors would flee the market. There'd be no stock in the market. It'd be an awful, an awful situation. So that's why I'm saying it's a bit of a you know, joke because I, I think implementing all those policies would be an absolute disaster for housing supply, not only in the inner city of Melbourne, but everywhere else. So we, we think that some of these small wins, these short wins like doing an audit, we've been calling on government to do a, to a local, state and federal government audit on all housing that is owned by government across all three tiers of government. And from that information, find out if there's any any stock in there that is able to be fitted out for the purposes of, of residential property right now. You know, that could be a, a quick win. You could have the Eurobadella Shire on the south coast of New South Wales late last year wrote to all of their short-stay holiday accommodation owners and said, look, we're really short of long-stay accommodation in this area and we can't get the workers, the business owners can't get the workers to run the local cafe because there's nowhere for them to live, because it's all in the short-stay market, would you consider, please, bringing it out of the short-stay market and putting it into the long-term market? And 70, no, no, it's only 70, but 70 said yes. For a small it, place like that, it's It's quite enough. A and so what happened is you ended up with, if you replicated that across all of the shires across Australia, you'd end up with about 40,000 properties into the market mm. if that same thing happened. Now, that might not be replicated across Australia. I get that. But even if you got 20,000, and it was just a simple letter, that their local government wrote to those owners, just and pleaded with them to do it. And so property owners, property investors, they are mum and dads, they're families. We know that of all of the housing stock that's rented in the market, 27% of all houses are owned by mum and dad investors in Australia. It's a huge number, worth about $3 trillion. And of that huge number, 70% of them are mum and dads that own one property other than the one they live in. Mm. So they have a conscience and they have a heart and they would would probably heed those calls and say, well, actually, I don't owe anything on this property. I do, I'd do. i hardly ever use it for short-stay accommodation for myself. And why not give it to a family for a longer-term investment, you know, longer-term, I get stable income from it rather than the, the vagaries of, of vacancy around short-stay markets. And so I, I think people would move. So they are little things that... We've been encouraging government to look at to get some quick wins on the board because putting new housing into the market instantaneously is is practically impossible with the constraint current constraints on supply and labour that we've, we're facing right now. Mm. Don't go away. We'll be back in just a moment with more from Hayden Groves. Are you on the lookout for your next investment property? Smart Property Investment and Pure Property Investment have done the research for you on where the hottest up-and-coming suburbs for 2024 are and where you should invest for the best return. The report is completely free to download. Visit smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Don't make any moves until you've read the report. Take your next step with all the facts, backed by research and industry experts. Welcome back to this special conversation with Hayden Groves. Hayden, it's been a very enlightening and interesting chat so far about what's going on. There's obviously so many pressures coming in on the market from every angle at the moment. I guess like it's hard to sort of wade through the middle of that. So thank you for laying it out so clearly for all the listeners today. I'm really curious where you see rent vesting going from here. The reason I bring it up is because I feel like there's probably a lot of people who, you know, maybe live on the eastern seaboard and, and can't afford to buy where they're currently living, but they're also not willing to give up that lifestyle of, of where they do live. But then you've also got the people that are being forced out of, um, you know, maybe see an out from being an owner occupier to get a bit more money in and, and maybe they'll downsize but keep the home and get someone else in there to be renting. Do you think that's going to cause some mass migration any which way over the next little while? Well, it's a really good point you raise, actually, because we are seeing a trend for people buying a property with the intention of living there, but sharing it with others and leasing out rooms and being quite happy to offset their cost of home ownership by renting out and sharing their own homes. And so we're seeing that trend continue. And I think that'll continue to grow as housing affordability continues to deteriorate and rental affordability at the same time, of course, is is deteriorating at a, at a slower rate, but still it's very tough for people to find homes. So that, that I think is a growing trend, but also we'll see household 
numbers expand as a result of the relative unaffordability of property in Australia right now. And so during the COVID years, we, of course, saw households start to break apart. And we there was a lot of stimulus in the economy. And so people had a, felt a bit wealthier. And so they were able to, to go out and get a home of their own rather than being in a share house situation. And because people also, of course, were forced to people that were living together, either as a family unit or a share house situation, lockdowns in places like Victoria, people were going a little crazy, right? Having to live under the one roof. And so they all looked to, that's why there was a, a flight to the regions mm. in part and into smaller accommodation. And, and that, that put upward pressure on rents because there wasn't the rental stock in the market to cope with that. Now, so what's happening now, and the Reserve Bank Governor has said the same, that one of the keys to addressing rental affordability will be that household formation will start to change. And we're already starting to see it where households are getting bigger again and people who were living out in an apartment on their own are now getting rid of that, putting it back out into the rental market and moving in into a share house situation to bring down their rent costs. And so that's a trend that will probably continue and will help the supply issue going forward. There's no doubt about that. And then on the top of that, you've got the build to rent sector, which is the darling of the, the Albanese government. They, they think it is going to be a, a great solution to putting more rental supply into the market. And they've made some adjustments to taxation settings for that particular cohort in order to encourage that. And that's something that we welcome. We we think that built to rent sector will put more valuable supply into the market. Note of caution, it's generally speaking not at the affordable end. These built to rent homes or, or properties rather are more of a bespoke product. They tend to appeal to the higher end of the market where people, as you say, who want that lifestyle, they want to be able to live in an inner city of, of Sydney or and or Melbourne where they get the lifestyle they afford. They've given up on the idea of owning a property an apartment that might be down in, in Darling Harbour, for example, but they might be able to rent something for much less, more or less for life. And they just like that opportunity and they don't, they might actually even own property elsewhere throughout the, the nation and they rent that out and they get an income from that, but they don't really have a plan to live there. They'd rather have the lifestyle opportunity of living in a city where they want to live. And so they're renting. And so that that's, I think, another trend that will carry on. And the built to rent sector will plug into that very neatly. And they will get, I think, some traction, particularly in the big cities, inner city environments, but it won't be affordable rentals. And if the federal government think that it's going to be an affordable rental solution, it's really not. It will free up other stock in the market because people will perhaps otherwise be renting something else, would be choosing to rent in a built to rent environment. And there was a notion that these institutional investors will make better landlords. I, I saw a quote from one of them suggesting that they'll make better landlords than mum and dads. I mean, really, I mean, uh, I mean, institutional investors want a number return. They don't, they don't care about the people within the house. They just, want, they just want to get the return. Otherwise, they're not interested in investing in it. So th- these big build to rent firms, institutional investors, they will not make better landlords than mum and dad investors that are using the professional services of a suburban real estate agent to look after their asset. They, because they, they will lack compassion through necessity, because they are looking purely at the return that they get on their investment, and so they should. But we think that's why it's so important to continue to encourage mum and dad investors to supply houses for Australians, that the the less you do that or the less you even talk about doing that, you see a flight from the market, changes to residential tenancy laws. You know, somebody was talking to backbenchers in the Federal Labor Party trying to make a name for themselves were talking about let's have a conversation around negative gearing settings again. And, and in fact, unbelievably, the chair of the Housing Affordability and Supply Council unbelievably came out recently and said, oh, well, I want to think about negative gearing settings. Let's have a look at it. I mean, all that does is frighten the horses and you end up with mum and dad investors thinking, oh, goodness, well, if I buy something, even if they've got the policy setting wrong, if, they, if their imp- impression about what might actually happen is different mm-hmm. to what actually happens if there are changes to policy in this area, it discourages investment. And it's the last thing we need right now. And as I said earlier in the in the show, thanks to Anthony Albanese and Julie Collins, the Minister for Federal Minister for Housing, for so emphatically continuing to support negative hearing and capital gains tax settings, because without it, the rental crisis would be far, far worse. Hayden, thank you so, so much for your time today. I feel like everyone who has listened is going to walk away with just a little bit more clear, concise guidance about what's going on right now. So we really, really appreciate your time and I'm already looking forward to the next chat. 
Grace, thanks so much for having me and have a, a terrific afternoon. To everyone who is listening along, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Like or review us on whatever platform that you do listen to your podcasts on. If you have any questions, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Until next time, stay safe and well wherever you are listening from. Bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.